A round of applause. Welcome, Terry. Yeah, thank you, my brother. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Good evening. Point the mic. We just do not do well with technology, I don't think. <laughs> uh, not my sons, but it's definitely above my pay grade, I can tell you that. So anything above a wheelbarrow is above my pay grade. <laughs> but I sure appreciate you guys and thanks for working with us. I hope, Drew, by the time this is over, y'all still have a sound machine. <laughs> System. I hope we don't destroy it entirely, brother. <laughs> that would be tragic. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. We're shooting for the works. YouTube don't like you. Nothing will like you anymore. So. I so appreciate uh, Drew and his wife and all those who are leading in praise. Thank you, guys. Just the presence of the Lord, and this has been consistent in our coming over the past years. The presence of the Lord and how the Lord uses you guys, it's a joy. Just want you all to know that. We love you dearly. Appreciate all of you. I can't believe you know, that we're actually liked, that we go to a place where we're liked. So thank you. <laughs> we love you guys too. <laughs> so it's been, uh, first time we met was in um, Brentwood, I think, some years ago, right? Uh, what? What year? 2014, okay, yeah. And uh, felt like it was a real God connection uh, when we met during that conference and uh, turned out to be the case, growing-wise, relationally and family now. I mean, they're stuck with us, in other words. If I ever address you as family, that your family went down, ours came up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, I hope that's not true, but it probably is. All right, so we're going to open with prayer again, and I'm going to just ask the Lord to do what only he can do. I am completely aware, as I should be, and becoming more and more aware, actually. So I can't be completely aware. I'm becoming more completely aware of the necessity of the Lord himself being the revealer of mystery, the mystery of Christ, the mystery of lawlessness, the mystery of time, the mystery of the churches, the mystery of the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, portions of it. God is the revealer of mysteries and the mystery. Paul says in Ephesians that you might understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, he says. Lord, I agree, you are a mystery. But it doesn't end there. You love to reveal yourself. You love to remove veils that are in me and that actually I am and say to me, to us, your people, here I am. Thank you. Thank you that that's your loving nature. As we look at the scriptures and they're your testimony, <clears throat> we encounter mystery needing to be unveiled by you by your spirit. So it's into your hands we commit our own hearts. Commit this time together. We trust you as Daniel had to trust you. God is the revealer of mysteries. many ways, Lord, the book of Revelation is like the dream that Nebuchadnezzar refused to tell that could only be made known by the revealer of mysteries, which is who you are, Lord. 
It's interpretation. It's understanding, only made known by you who are the revealer of mysteries. We give you the glory, Lord Jesus. You're the glorious one forever and ever and ever and ever. Even as Drew was leading us tonight, Lord, into that place of intimacy before you and to praise and worship of you, Lord. May we keep our eyes focused there. As, even as I'm sharing, Lord, may our eyes not divert away from you. What you started here tonight, continue. Our gazing upon you. Drawing us. Captivating us. Conquering. Being who you are in our inward being. Thank you, Jesus. It is always by your spirit, Lord, always. We acknowledge that, confess that, proclaim it. So again, Lord, commit ourselves, our time, this time, to you. Unveil yourself. You who are the mystery of the Godhead, the mystery of purpose and plan, the mystery of all that is in the future, all that you will be, Lord, you are the beginning of time and you are its fulfillment. Secure in even a deeper way tonight this relationship that you have inaugurated with each of us that we said yes to. Secure us on that ground of love of passion for you, even greater passion, more fiery, intimate passion than ever before unto you, Lord. Secure that tonight, even on a more firm foundation of yourself, we ask, inwardly speaking. In the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name, that every name, Lord, whatever that name may be, does not compare for your name is above. And every knee will bow and every tongue confess, you are the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So we're going tonight to Revelation chapter 3. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read, uh, starting with verse number 7 here in Revelation chapter 3, and really on unto the end here. But commenting as we move through this passage, I better open up a bottle of water here. My voice was uh, a little bit weak before coming, and I can tell it's getting a little strained. Um, that huge fight Donna and I had before we came really strained my mind. <laughs> That's not true. I thought I'd make sure you're awake out there. What huge fight? Tell us the details. One detail you really need to know. She won again. No. <laughs> I'm joking. See, isn't that a rotten sense of humor? <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Revelation chapter 3, verse number 7. That's not why Donna's not here at all. We didn't have no big fight. She's there helping uh, take care of some of the sick grandbabies, Josiah's children, helping Jordan, Josiah's wife. And uh, they have four children, you know, so Donna's there helping. And Isaac's three had just come through. 
I think Amos is still finishing up some of the battle with sickness. So Donna is a great grandmother, mother, wife, woman of God. I so love her. So appreciate. Don't you appreciate your wives, husbands? What do you think, Dylan? Do you appreciate your wife there? <laughs> God, put, you, put you on the spot, doesn't it? I, he, he got it right. You trained him well. I just want you to know. Just, he got it right. <laughs> so the newly married, what, what, what do you think, Bryce? Oh, yes, yes. yes that's right. I'm trying to stir up trouble. Can you tell that? So, <laughs> not going to work. Good. All right. So chapter 3, verse number 7. <clears throat> and to the angel or messenger, right? I believe, um, and, and it's probably both. I'm not saying it's one or the other. It's probably both. Um, the messenger is the, is the right way of saying this of the church at Philadelphia, right? So there's the human side of that. There is the angelic side of that, both, I think. It's not just one or the other. But he who is holy... He who is true, who has the key of David, who opens, no one will shut, and who shuts, and no one opens, says this. Now, for a moment, just I said I would comment on this, but um, don't think of just the earth in this statement. Perhaps more importantly, you can think of the earth, that's fine, that's great, it's true. But what about an open heavens. What about the Lord having, don't you think, Mike, what about the Lord giving us an opening in the heavens with him? And what we're reading about here is a divine initiative so that we can understand, we can see. You know what I mean, Jeff? We can understand, we can see, John. What we could not understand or see before. Kathy, Scott, don't you think? What about that? Isn't that beautiful? Yes. And um, it's being brought into sight here by that. I just want to comment on it that it's not just on this earth. It has absolutely the power of God as it comes to the earth. But what is most important is that it begins with the Lord in the heavens so that he can be manifested through his people in this earth. So for the Lord to say that he has opened what no one can shut and he has shut what no one can open, the heavenly truth of that is astounding. No demon can shut it when God opens it. Man can either as pertains to the earth. may be able to shut their hearts, but they will not be able to shut and stop what God has opened in this. So just want to comment on this to, to add to, at least in my own thinking, um, a more complete a may or more full understanding of God opening both what is the heavenly and the earthly. He says, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door <clears throat> which no one can shut. Quite the promise, wouldn't you say? Again, the heavenly side of that, the earthly side of that. And because you have a little power, I, now, can we just stop there for a second? What do you think, Brian? So it's not all about power. Because you have a little. Not a lot of power was needed. Humanity so looks for power. World rulers want power. They want money, yes, but they want more than money. They want power. They want control. I've talked to people that think, well, you know, just to be blunt with you, they're like, you know, Jacob, they're like, well, you know, we got the money, therefore we can control everything until a person with a gun blows your brains out. Then what are you going to control? because they've got power. 
Now I disguised that a little, the way I said it, as to a real conversation with people who have more money than imaginable, who think they have control because they have money. Would not be the first nor the last to think having money is the ultimate answer. And I'm not talking about little money at all. Anyway, isn't that right, Josiah? <laughs> but it's that way of thinking. People have that way of thinking. I have the money I can control. No, you can't. There's always someone with more power and authority to take what you have. You know, uh, sidestep for a second, bring this a little bit more clear. We such, so we need the governmental. And the governmental without money can control. The government with money can control to an, a degree that we don't want to see. A government with the economy, resources, money, whatever, that has military, we start moving into, I'm going to just use my own phraseology here, a scary form of control. And if you have government that has the economics, the resources, the military, the medical, the pharmaceutical, and the spiritual, then you have a system. A system that allows ultimate control. Right? I wanted to say that right, Jeff, so that we could understand it's not just that Satan wants to mark you in a way of saying, oh, these are mine. That mark is control in those areas I just mentioned. He wants you in that system so he can completely control you. He wants to control you governmentally. He wants to control you financially. He wants to control you, so we're bringing the, e the government and the economic, but more than that, he's going to control you by military. He's going to control you by spirituality, religion. He's going to control you by the medical. He's going to control you by the pharmaceutical. And we could go on. Satan just doesn't want a mark on you to say, oh, there's a mark. We've got to see that that mark represents control in all of these areas. That's what we're seeing. Amen? Can we see that clearly? Aren't we, Scott? We're seeing something that is bringing control to all of these areas. Do you know, the question is, does the church of Jesus Christ recognize what's happening? What do you think, John? Do we recognize it? Can we see it, Jacob? Or like what we talked about last night, there's a blindness and a deafness that's upon God's people. We should be able to see, no, Satan just, oh, I don't want the mark. That mark is an allegiance to everything I mentioned and more. You are under the governmental control. You are under the economic control. You can't buy or sell if you're not under the governmental control, under the military control, protection. We could add police in there. You're under the, the control religiously. You're in the right, their right religion for you. You're under control medically. Pharmaceutically, we could go on. And if you're not in that, then you are subject to a concentration camp, subject to death, subject to being murdered. Say, so that can't happen. Guys, it just happened a few years ago in Nazi Germany. What do you mean it can't happen? The government will rescue it. It was the government that caused it. Okay, YouTube, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Sam will save me. Uncle Sam betrays you. Sorry, is that too blunt? I'm not saying everybody in the government is evil. I'm just saying most of them are. 
I'm saying this, really. I'm saying in the hierarchy of things, that's where there's a problem. Not in the necessarily the ordinary people, but if the ordinary people are following the hierarchy, Jacob, Houston, we got a problem. Well, I'm telling you, Houston, we got a problem. What are we going to do about it, Drew? As I've said many times, I like to quote John Wayne from the Searchers movie. Anybody ever watch that? You old timers, you watch the Searchers movie with John Wayne? So Ward Bond is the reverend, Jeff, in that movie. I said this last night to Jacob and Michael. So the reverend tells John Wayne, who they were both in the Civil War, and he says, I didn't see you at the surrender. That's what Ward Bond says to John Wayne. He said, I wasn't at the surrender. What do you think about that, Dylan? He said, I still got my sword, reverend, and I ain't turned it into no plowshare either. I said it this way. I still got my guns, boys. I ain't turned it into no plowshare either. And it's not all for hunting. <laughs> Ask me if I'm kidding, because I'm not. There's never been freedom maintained for any length of time that's not been fought for. South has been conquered once. We should learn. Can you believe somebody would say that? I'm saying it. Man, I do not trust. God, I do. And that's the end of it. <laughs> Man, Terry. Our forefathers had had the wimpy attitude that I see in the church presently would still be under English command and control. But God had something better for this nation, and he still does. And it's going to be up to we the people to decide whether we become a part of the Antichrist system or we fulfill the will of God and be a nation that's a refuge so that people can flee away from Europe, flee away from the northern, North African nations, flee away from the Middle Eastern nations and part of Asia, and get to this nation where they can have some form of freedom to where there can be a part of the earth, Revelation 12, that helps to protect the woman. Now, not just this nation, other areas of other nations as well, including Ireland, including Scotland, nations that Gabriel spoke to me about back in 2001, but others. We have become the sleeping giant again. God must wake us up. It took Pearl Harbor to wake us up in 41. I know I'm frightening some of you. You say, well, the preacher shouldn't be saying that. I absolutely should and have been commanded by the Lord to do just what I'm doing. Say so he wouldn't do that. He absolutely did. And it wasn't no dream and it wasn't no vision. He's standing right in front of me. <laughs> someone, someone, some ones of us have to say the hard thing. I don't even find it that hard. So anyway, back to the message. <laughs> I'm going to preach Jesus while, bear, while wearing the armament of God and other armament. <laughs> anyway, so let's go on. Just think I got all of that out of those just those few verses. <laughs> so you're still looking for it. <laughs> I told you it was a mystery. <laughs> what do we do, Terry? We pray for leaders. Pray for leaders like we had with George Washington. Leaders, not wimps. Not people who are led by money or lust for power or recognition or ambition. The people who understand the mind and will of God. Governmental leaders, economic leaders are needed. Military leaders are needed. Is that not right? And yes, 
God-appointed leaders who understand the will of God for the nation. Are they not needed? It's those four coupled together. If you have a government who understands the will of God because the voice of the Lord is among them, if you have religious people, let's say it this way, truly godly people, not just religious, who know what God's will is and can speak to governmental leaders who have ears to hear, economic leaders, I'm talking about people with lots of money, billions of dollars, some trillions, those people, I'm saying, as well as others, who can build our way out of this mess, take back our farms, Grow food that is healthy again. You see what I'm saying? Where there has been that taken, there is opportunity. Can we see that? There is opportunity. The Lord told me years ago, build your way out of this. It's been taken, take it back. <laughs> anyway, so I, that sounds like a Joseph International meeting of years ago when I, world leaders would come and we'd talk about this. <clears throat> anyway, so... Guys, I'm saying to us, if you get those types of people, military leaders and economic leaders and governmental leaders and those who understand the will of God together, we need those leaders right now. Where are they? This nation has never been having such a lack as it does now. So I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say it publicly so the Lord can take it wherever he wants to take it since his live stream. We call forth, do we not? We pray. We call forth, Lord, what is your purpose? What is your will in this matter? For governmental type people, I'm not that. You can tell that. They'll get me anywhere near a button with a nuclear weapon. <laughs> we call forth those who are by God's design to be governmental people. Those who are meant to be the economic people. I don't have two nickels to rub together, so don't worry about that one with me either. So, those, <laughs> That's not true, but I'm playing. <clears throat> those who have that economic call, we need them, do we not? We're going to need the resources that God has given to them to support the government that God wants to bring forth in order to restore the republic for which is God's purpose. Right? Is that not true? We need military leaders who understand the times and understand what needs to do, what to be done. I'm praying for governors particularly. They're key to our nation. I'm going to say that to you. The governors are key. The governors are key. All right. You all want me to stop there? I hope this is helping us. Anybody feel helped or worried? <laughs> You know, I wish, I don't know if y'all saw this movie, but anybody watched the old movie years ago came out called Tombstone? I mean, come on, more of you than that watched it. You just don't want to raise your hand. I watched it. I loved that movie. I still got it. Anyway, I remember that one scene, Drew, when they're, remember they're in the theater, the cowboys are all down there, you know, and they do this one scene and they like the scene and they take their pistols out and just start shooting up in there. <laughs> That's what should have happened after that message I just gave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the real reason we bring pistols. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, I know your deeds. Behold, I put before you an open door, he says to his people which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. I want to focus in on they have kept the word of his testimony is being spoken of here. They have kept the word of his testimony inwardly and thus outwardly. They have kept the word of his testimony. So I want to lock and load that as we proceed on through this. Secondly, <clears throat> they have not denied my name. Right? They have not denied my name. Two things said there. They may only have a little power, but they have kept the word of the testimony of Jesus, and they have not denied the name of the Lord. That ties in with Israel being a people of the name. When they came out of Egypt, 
Yahweh had defeated all Egyptian deities in the showdown as God confronted the Egyptian deities through Moses and Aaron, right? The name of Yahweh was superior to all Egyptian gods. So when they came in uh, to cross the Jordan after the 40 years in the desert and new generation coming, when they prepared to cross the Jordan and go to battle, right? God promising to give them that land and they had to fight for every square inch of it. Hello? Funny how that works. You said you were going to give it to us. I am. I'm his very name, Dylan. He's the Lord of Armies. The Lord of the Saboth. Lord of Armies. Right? That's not the Jesus I know. I know. <laughs> That's part of the problem. The Church of Jesus Christ don't know him that way. We just know him in the mode we want to know him in. Now that may not be true of anybody here, but there's people listening online that that's probably true. Because <laughs> when you got Ken and Brian and others sharing like Randall here and Drew and them singing beautiful songs. Did you write that one, by the way? I meant to ask you. I thought so. Drew, that it was beautiful. Beautiful. If I had a voice, I'd steal it and make some money off of it. No. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so the tribes there in Canaan, the ites, were afraid because the people of the name, the name who had defeated Egypt, the kingdom of Egypt, the empire of Egypt was coming there. The name of the Lord went before them and brought terror and fear to his enemies. That name. You've not denied my name. He's been made way too uh, impotent the Lord has, way too small. And I said it this way, way for his people, way too compromising. He's the name above every name. He wants to prove that within our hearts again. He wants to prove that among us again. There is no one like unto him. Who is so foolish to stand against him. Who can resist him? If it comes to battle, everybody loses. He always wins. So the key is be one with him. Join, right? That's the invitation to a love relationship. He doesn't want to be at war with us. That's not his intention. Let's not be at war with him. But he has enemies who will war until they are put away. And so the tribes of Canaan feared the name of, their, of the God of the Israelites, feared that name who had humbled Egypt. Right? Used to be a fear of the Lord in the house of God. I'm afraid it's gotten lost. Not that it makes us run away, but makes us run to the Lord. Makes us understand his greatness, how awesome he truly is. I'm afraid at times that he's become to us too familiar. So, behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. So there's a... Uh, an assembly that is revealed here, Satan is actually in charge of that assembly. But they're claiming to be God's people. God says they're liars. And don't be deceived by the lie. Just because 
group of people claim to be the Lord's doesn't mean they are the Lord's. That's proven by life. The light of his life. Not words, right? Behold, I will make them to come and bow down at your feet and to know that I have loved you. So I'm going to skip over here real quick <clears throat> to the latter part of um, Revelation chapter 3 and what is said to the church at Philadelphia. So the Lord says, because you have kept my word, right? Then in verse uh, 11 and 12, let's read it. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have. You've kept the word of his testimony. Hold fast the word of his testimony in order that no one can take your crown. He's answering what was said earlier about them by now his promise to them in overcoming. I want us to see that tied together. He said that you've not denied my name. He says, I'm going to he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he will not go out from it anymore. And I listen to this, I will write upon him the name. So because they had not denied his name, now God's going to write upon them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Threefold does God answer the fact that they have not denied his name with threefold promised blessing to them concerning the name. The name of his God, the name of the city of his God, and his new name are promised to them who have not denied his name. The promise of keeping his word, the word of his testimony, is seen in 11 in the first verse of, of first few uh, stanzas of, of chapter uh, 3, verse 12. So you won't lose your crown, and I'll make you a pillar. Because you've kept the word of his testimony. So I just want us to see that for a moment. Not only that, then let's go back. Chapter 9, another promise. Behold, I will cause them that are claiming to be the people of God. That's what they're saying, but Satan's actually in charge of what's going on. It's the same thing Jesus would say to Peter, right? Get behind me, Satan. You don't concern yourself with the things of God. Satan let me key in on this for a second. Why would Jesus say that? Because Peter didn't want the cross. Neither do these people. They're a synagogue of Satan because they don't want the cross. They want their own life, their best life now. Peter and they find out the hard way. Without the cross, unless you take up your cross, you cannot be my disciple. Isn't that right, Denise? Isn't that the truth? So they're claiming, but like the church at Sardis. The church at Sardis had a name, had a reputation for life. The Lord said, you're dead. That thing you've got going on, that outward thing that you're doing that you think is the life of the Lord, it's death. It's outward. It's of the soul. It's of your flesh. Quite the uh, statement by the Lord concerning Sardis. That's not what we want, right? We want inward reality. And him coming through us in the outward, yes, amen. An outward expression, but coming from the inward reality of the Lord. That order must not be broken. It must be established, divine order from within to without. The realness of the Lord's life and life, life and light of life coming forth in outward manifestation. Right? I think that's going on here, by the way. I can say that here. I wouldn't be able to say that every place I go, but I believe that to be going on. I do. I believe that for a long time. That's not new. But there's a lot, guys, as y'all know, sad to say, there's a lot out there that's claiming the Lord just I hit on it this morning. But the Lord's not in it. He didn't originate it. He's not the source of it, the life of it. 
Anyway, so here's the promise he makes to them. Those who are mocking you, giving you trouble, I'm going to make them come and bow down and they're going to acknowledge something that you have been loved by the Lord. You are the beloved of the Lord, relationally speaking. Okay. So, let's move forward. Verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance. Now, I spoke on that at the conference in July, so I'm not going to recover this. It was actually the first message I ever did entirely on perseverance. I wanted to, at that time, come into this, but uh, we'd still be doing that message if that had been the case. <laughs> said, because you've kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing. Interesting. The way the word is used, the Greek word is used here, hour, is the breaking down in the four components of a day, morning, noon, evening, and night. The promise here, I will keep you from the hour of testing. That is the hour, according to Paul and Thessalonians, of darkness, which would be night. Night. That's what Jesus warned about. The night is coming when no man can work. We are not children of the darkness, but children of the day, of the light. The day should not overtake us, right? So his promise is this, as he says this, that in that hour of darkness and in that hour of testing, simply meaning to prove, to bring forth proof that one belongs to the Lord. Proven by testing, to be tried. Proven in adversity. Proven in difficulty. Proven in temptation. He says, I will keep you. It's this word from that can create problems. The mindset of, of many of the Lord's people is just keep me from going through anything, and he's not going to do that. He's going to keep us while we go through it. He's going to prove us not by keeping us from going through it. How does he prove us by not allowing us to go through anything? That would be directly in contradiction to what's being said here. So he's keeping us, he's proving to Satan. He's proving to demons. He's proving to ourselves that he's greater in us than what's in the world. Right? The strength of God is coming to increase by the conflict and the adversity. Anything that is of God in your life is proven by the conflict that surrounds it. If you're having just a good time all the time, and if that's what we want is a good time all the time, you're of no, no use to the Lord. Can I say that a little more mild? Ain't our, aren't, aren't I of little, a little bit used? No. <laughs> that doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It means you're not useful. I'm simply saying this. The Lord doesn't want us in diapers forever. Right? You guys who have small children. How many of you ladies who have small children will be glad when the diaper stage is over? <laughs> Let me see a show of hands. Anybody got, got a diaper or pampers or whatever you got now? Josiah? That's, you're not a lady, but I mean, <laughs> I was going to say something, but I won't. <laughs> I'll just need more in there. All right, how about you husbands? How many will be glad to see that stage come and go? You know, I was so glad. We had five children. I was so glad when we didn't have to buy that anymore. Well, 
by going through the adversity, by being tried, being going through the hour of testing, God, this is God's purpose. God's purpose is that he become our strength, Randall, right? He become our strength. The battle is that we're wanting to overcome by our natural strength. God wants to bring adversity to crush our natural strength and cause us to trust in him and depend only in him, as I was saying last night. Because there's going to come a time, and we're <laughs> in such a time, there's going to be a time when human energy, human strength, human willpower, all that is carnal, all that is natural, is not going to get it done. It's going to demand the Lord be greater in us, right? Right? That's good news. So he's not attempting to kill us, not in, you know, I mean the cross working, yes, but he's challenging my own willpower. I can be a strong-willed individual. Now, I know that means nothing to anyone in here because I know you're all submissive, immediately obedient. So... I'm talking to myself right now. So, but for me, I can be strong-willed. I can be stubborn. If you don't believe that, ask Donna. <laughs> Why didn't you laugh? <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> you know, it's the truth. <laughs> so, so the dynamic is the Lord's dealing with us so that we don't resemble ourselves anymore. Not physically, spiritually, inwardly. Don't you think that a person who's claiming to know the Lord and been in the Lord for 20 years but still acting like they were 20 years ago from the inside that there's a problem? That the cross of Christ hasn't been able to really accomplish much? Right? Don't you think there should be at least one thing, one thing out of 47 million, one thing... <laughs> I'm in this humorous move, and you guys are a bunch of sticks in the mud out there right now. I just, <laughs> I got to play. At least I got a laugh out of you. You're not really sticks in the mud. I'm just in this humorous mood in the midst of this intense message. I kind of like it. <laughs> There's been times when it was really intense, and I'm like, stop. <laughs> stop. I don't want to preach anymore. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's actually happened multiple times over the last 10 years or more. This is enough, Lord, enough. But he doesn't listen to me, and I don't expect him to. I wouldn't listen to me either if I was him. I just want to listen to him. <laughs> so what goes on in this then is the Lord's into being our strength, not giving me strength. The problem is the strength that I have is my strength. So he's not looking at strengthening me. He's looking at coming in as strength. He's looking at possessing me. He's looking at a hostile takeover. <laughs> Don't you think? Don't you think, Debbie? Hostile takeover. <laughs> That's right. That's what I'm after. I'm after a hostile takeover. Banks do it all the time. <laughs> so why does, can't the Lord do it? <laughs> So, we're being in this hour of darkness, he says. You're going to be tested in that hour of darkness. You're meant to be tested in that hour of darkness. And again, he who overcomes, he says, verse 12 through 13. So, he overcomes, verse 12, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He will go out. Uh, he will not go out. Excuse me. He will not go out from it any more. You look forward to that, that kind of relationship? That's a relationship. Yes. We're not departing. We're not in and out in the relationship with the Lord. We're not, the Lord's winning today, I'm winning the next day, that kind of a thing. Who's winning? I want the Lord to win. I want the Lord to conquer me. I want the Lord to overcome me. So if he overcomes me, then he'll be the overcomer inside me. He is the overcomer, but he's trying to overcome me. Amen. So, guys, it's not okay to act like ourselves. The Holy Spirit's within us to bring forth Christ. I know the difference between me and the Lord. Don't you? 
I shouldn't be fooling anyone, especially myself. That was the Lord. Are you kidding? <laughs> you mean you slapping that? <laughs> that's not the Lord. That's you. If you shot him, that's the Lord. But if you slapped him, that, no, I'm kidding, totally kidding. Totally kidding. <laughs> At least I write John 3.16 on my bullets. <laughs> God, that's the, that's the seed I'm sowing of the gospel. No, I'm totally kidding. That's my sick humor again. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> You call, you call that nine millimeter seat if you want to. <laughs> you think you could get a song out of that? <laughs> the nine millimeter song. <laughs> so let's get back to the scriptures. We better, don't you think? I will write upon him the name of my God. Could there be, let's, in these few verses right here, or few parts of this verse. Jacob, do you think there could be a greater promise than what's right here? What do you think, Susan? I'll write on you the name of my God. What do you think, Jeff? Is that significant? That's incredible. That's a possession issue. You belong to him. Isn't that what we want? Malachi chapter 3, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. A book of remembrance was written concerning them. They shall be mine, declares the Lord, on the day that I make up my treasured ones. And I shall protect them as a father protects his son. I had the Lord say that verse right straight to me. I cried right back to him when he said it. That's all I've ever wanted to be was yours. I don't care about all the stuff. I just want to be yours. Stuff I mean, I mean, God is good, and he's gracious, and he's kind, but it's him we want. It's him we're in love with, right? The relationship has all kinds of God benefits for eternity. But like the priesthood of old, I'm not giving you a land. I'm giving you myself. I will be your inheritance. To Abraham, I will be your exceeding great reward. Isn't that what we're after? That's the priesthood God's after. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. It means that his city, his city, you dwell there with him, in him, together, living stone upon living stone. The city that God built that Abraham was looking for. Abraham was looking for that city. He was not satisfied with any city on this earth. He was looking for a different one that only God could build. Isn't that right, Denise? Only God could build that city. He still can. He's the only one. The new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven, it's not of this earth, it's not built that way. Comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. What do you think that new name is? What's that new name going to mean to us, bridegroom? What's it mean to a bride to lose her name and gain the name of another? Are we willing? I remember an encounter I had years ago where the, the Lord encountered me in that kind of a dynamic a uh, wedding type of dynamic, living in Kansas City at the time. And um, up in the old building there, John, there used to be a library up in the old metal building, the big long one, the 600 and something foot long building that was the exact length of, length of Noah's Ark. Remember that? Did you know that? It was prophesied that it would be before they ever purchased it. Bob Jones prophesied the fact that it would be the exact length of Noah's Ark. It was. It had been a sports center. Bob described the carpet inside of it. He'd never been in it, but he described it. Well, anyway, they purchased it. That old library used to pray there a lot. And one night I was praying with my friend Eric Griffin, still my friend. 
and the Lord appeared to me and he was directing me into this wedding type ceremony. So he says this to me. He says, do I take you, Terry? He says, I take you to be mine. Then he switched and said, but do you take me? I was about to answer. And he stopped me, Drew. He said, uh, do you give up your name? Without thinking, I, I said, what's in a name? He said, your identity. He said, you cannot take my name on. And my name's above every name. And at my name, every knee bows and every tongue confesses. And you cannot keep your name and take mine if you're going to be joined to me. Now, I didn't change my name from Terry Bennett. He was referring to spiritual dynamics inwardly. A possession dynamic of being his and no longer my own. And he went on, I won't tell you the rest of it, but uh, I remember afterwards, it got quiet, and Eric said afterwards, said, I went on, Terry, I knew something had to go on, he said. He said, all I could smell, he said, Eric said this to me, all I could smell was burning flesh. I said, yeah. I said, it was my flesh burning. <laughs> the Lord was talking about around the world how people's names and faces are plastered. And people, you know, follow the names and follow the faces. And we forget the Lord. There's the jealousy of God in that. Should be chasing Jesus, right? After the Lord. So, well, let's go on. I'm not even halfway through the message. I don't have, know what time it is, but it's got to be getting late. So, so y'all missed your opportunity. You should have said, Amen. <laughs> No, Terry, it was late 30 minutes ago. <laughs> Hadn't it been great that the, the sound system's not messed up one time? That's amazing, especially the amount of deliverance I need. <laughs> There's my humor again. He who has an ear to hear Verse 13, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So he who overcomes, now I said a little bit about this last night. I want to revisit it. In chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, we see then the rider of the white horse going forth. Again, I talked about this in verse 2. Uh, my NASB uh, translates it conquering and to conquer, but it's the same Greek word as we just read in chapter 3 of overcoming, overcomer, overcomer, overcoming. Same word. And that word is used consistently throughout the book of Revelation. So the rider of the white horse, which is not the Lord Jesus, right? He comes at the end. This rider is going forth to overcome. He's overcoming and to overcome. That means he is overcoming some and others he is attempting to overcome. Both. So that that is his intent. And so we can gather from all of the churches here. If we go back and read it, and I'm sure you have. I'm not going back to read all of it. But it's said to them consistently, he that overcomes. So the showdown is going to be that of our, let's say it this way, is the Lord in us overcoming him or is he overcoming us? That's the showdown. I want to get that word locked in for a second, that phrase. That is the showdown. Who wins? Who's overcoming? Who's being overcome? And who's overcoming? Revelation chapter 12 then, I barely touched 6-2, said it'd stay long, didn't intend to. Revelation chapter 12, here's what's going on with the woman and here's what's going on with the man-child. Verse 11, and they overcame him. Who? The dragon. The dragon, the man of lawlessness, the false prophet, an unholy trinity, Satan. The, let's just say it this way. The dragon, 
Satan, the devil, that's what he's called in chapter 12. He's the one who deceived Eve, deluding her. Right? Now there's another woman, not Eve. And that woman won't be deluded. Can you say amen to that? She will not be deceived. I choose that relationship, don't you? That's the relationship we are all meant to have with the Lord. It is a relationship where deception is no longer possible because we know the Lord. Paul says in Philippians, I want to know him, right? And the greatest uh, threat that the enemy is going to give and the counterfeit and then the deluding miracles and signs and wonders and all that he's going to do can be easily overcome by the knowing of the Lord within. You don't need a lot of power. You just need to know the Lord. He is the power. So don't misunderstand me. Oh, there's going to be a lot of power, not just from the enemy either. There's going to be the authoritative power of God being manifested and nobody can stand against it. Amen, Jacob? Isn't that right, Michael? That's what's going to happen, Dad. It's not going to happen. Certain. Don't you think, Drew? Satan thinks he's going to get all his way. I'm convinced he's not. Think about it. This is laughable. I know kingdoms of history that were a lot longer than what Satan, the dragon, <laughs> the dragon, the man of lawlessness, and the false prophet have a few short years. There's been Rome lasted almost a thousand. There's a seven. That's laughable. Nazi Germany was 12, 13. Sorry, but let me just laugh. Psalm 2, God's laughing about it. <laughs> if you were wise, and they're not, but if you were, you would not be acting this way towards my Messiah. I've installed him as king. If you were wise, you'd be kissing his feet. Because if I tell you kiss off, it's forever. How about that? What if the Lord says that? <laughs> Come on, laugh about it, guys. Come on, it's laughable. Seven years, I'm sorry, but it's laughable. That Satan, get it, the dragon throws the best he's ever had. Seven years and it's over. You gotta laugh about it. That's not, that's, here's John Wayne again. If that's all you got. <laughs> that's El Dorado. <laughs> Can you tell I'm a big John Wayne fan? <laughs> Grew up that way. <laughs> There's a lot of other John Wayne quotes I could quote, but they're not worth the quoting. <laughs> so they overcome him, verse 11, they overcome him. The dragon is being spoken of here as you back up. The dragon is overcome by the blood of the lamb. So, I actually got notes tonight. Can you believe that? Very seldom do I get to write notes. That's not because it's wrong to have notes. Ever since I watched the Chosen movie, I realized Jesus had them. <laughs> now, I actually like the Chosen thing. I do. I like it. I I don't think he had notes. I don't think Matthew helped him with them either. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> Just because a guy can write doesn't mean he has any spiritual intelligence. It's obvious Matthew had none. <laughs> I won't figure out one thing in The Chosen. Well, I won't say it. I, I like it, I do. Season three is coming out, and I hope that it's good. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, I just threw the chosen under the bus. <laughs> I know that. I don't, don't really mean it that way. But guys, I don't think Jesus needed notes, do you? Because he knew the scriptures. That's where he was coming out of. These things speak of me. He's preaching himself out of the scriptures to them. You don't need notes to do that. Don't you think? I might need notes. I need, my, the main note I got here is my own name. That's how bad it is. Can't even remember that. <laughs> 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 
So they, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for laughing. I appreciate that. It's good to have humor, don't you think, guys? <clears throat> so they overcome him by the blood of the lamb. So they are defeating the dragon in every way, in every battle, in every temptation. Satan is being defeated by the Lord Jesus in the woman, through the woman, and through the man-child. Is that not an astounding statement? So, Satan, the dragon, can't win against that woman. And so it is that woman and the man-child that is birthed by God through that woman who is the final answer to Genesis 3.15, the final solution. He will crush the serpent, the dragon's head. Here it is. They overcome him. His government, Jeff, the dragon's government, the false prophet's government, the lawless man's government is crushed, has no power over her, no authority over her. The will of the enemy is utterly broken, helpless against her. She will not respond to the temptation, to what he is offering the rest of the world. She has no part in it. She is not of it, and she will not be. Amen, Dylan. What do you think about that? Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? So Satan, uh, not being able to overcome her, moves to a different tactic, but I don't want to go there right now. So it is true that the Lord himself, having conquered Satan, has left Satan here to overcome him through us while training us, preparing us, teaching us, gaining all ground in us, body, soul, and spirit. And the Lord could have just wiped him out and put him away, but instead his plan was in bringing a bride, original intent, original purpose, man did not have to fall to be a bride. He would have been a bride without the fall. Man didn't have to sin to come into that purpose. He just had to obey to come into that purpose. He had to say yes to the Lord and no to the enemy. Christ himself was tried and tested for 30 years, proven. Every, his soul was completely tried by everything we go through, every temptation, everything coming at him for 30 years until the baptism. When John baptizes him and the Lord, the voice out of heaven says to the Lord, the Father does, this is my beloved son in whom I am now well pleased. He's well pleased. He's been tried. He's been tested. He's been proven. He has become a savior to the uttermost. You'd never be able to say, well, you know, he didn't go through like what we thought. You're right. He goes through far worse than we ever could imagine. I'm telling you, every way that Satan could try to get at him, he was doing so to no avail for 30 years. In the last three and a half years of the ministry of Christ, the Lord was taking it to him to the point that he forces Satan to murder him. Satan is forced to that avenue. There's no other way to stop him. And even that, the Lord was very clear, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down freely. So who holds the reins of authority there? Right? This one we have to do with, this one living inside of us, this Messiah, this Christ, this Son of the living God, this Son of man, this King of kings, this Lord of lords, he does not fear Satan. 
Satan fears the full measure of Christ in this people. That's what he fears. So he would allure us to Christianity in its weakness, in its fleshliness, in its carnal strength and carnal mind. Is that not true? Would allure us to the outward, the outward, the outward. Don't get possessed by Jesus. He'll conquer me all over again through you. So he lures us to the outward. He lures us to soulish Christianity that doesn't have the life inside, but has a form of godliness, but denied the power of Christ and his cross. He'll feed us the outward as long as we don't allow him, Christ, to be the inward. He fears Christ in full measure in us. So why not, not go there just quickly? <laughs> Let's let the Lord have all of us. Finish this thing, Lord, finish this thing. Right? So, he's training us, and he's been training us. These tests, the trying of our faith is much more precious than gold, even gold refined in the fire. Don't give in to your flesh. I don't care what the situation is, don't give in to it. Do not give in to the devil, right? You don't have to. You don't need to. If that's an established pattern, let the Lord break it. Right? Greater is he. Let him be. So God's left the forces of evil, all of them here, that are not in hell right now. They're not having a party down there in hell. They're in torment, those demons that are there. The ones that are still loosed here, they're attacking us. They're trying to control the world governments. They're kind of trying to bring everything together against the anointed one, Psalm 2. Everything against the anointed one, everything against Christ. So who's Satan afraid of? Is he afraid of America? He is not. Is he afraid of me? He is not. He's afraid of Christ who, let me just use Tennessee language. You already put a butt whipping on him one time. Going to do another one. <laughs> Sorry, is that okay? <laughs> That's the Tennessee way of saying it. The Lord wore him out, guys, on the cross. Satan thought he had the victory. It was his greatest, most tragic, and final defeat in the person of Jesus Christ. He wins by dying. And after three days of that, comes back. Well, I'm saying this to get to some other points here. I know this is a long message. I hope it's a good one. Well, I get that's yet to be determined. So Christ is chosen. Now, I won't get into all this, but this is out of Chronicles 26. Christ is chosen to build the house of God through the battles that have been won, the conflicts that have been won. It is by the battles being won that the house of God was built there in Chronicles 26. Saul knew it. David knew it. The plunder from the battles were kept to the building of the house of God. What's that saying, Terry? That means that the enemies of God being defeated were part of the necessary components, Dylan, for the house of God to be really built. Right? That's what's playing out in the book of Revelation in this love story. Playing out all over again. Christ in us, the hope of glory defeating Satan, thus proving God's absolute right over us, God's absolute right in us. Satan absolutely has no legal authority, no legal right over any of us. That's the blood right. They overcame him by the blood. We have come into complete alignment and agreement with him. We are his. We do not belong to ourselves. We belong to the Lord. But that's proven in battle. That's proven in conflict. That's not proven in, oh, just make my life easy. We, we'll stay infants. It's proven, and that's how the house of God is built. It's built by battle. 
It's built by conflict. And God is orchestrating our battles and orchestrating the showdowns and the conflicts corporately and individually so that we will trust in the Lord and never ourselves. Amen. 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 I get excited. I'm sorry. I have to raise my voice. I'm not raising my voice. I'm not angry. I'm not any of that. Just how excited about the Lord. The Lord is good. He knows what's best, does he not? So, Christ is proving to Satan, they don't belong to you. That's Malachi 3. You shall be mine. Yes, Lord. He, in a direct encounter, he was saying it to me, you shall be mine. I didn't catch it at first. He said it again, you shall be mine. I still didn't catch it. Dense. You shall be mine. Third time, Denise, he's like, <laughs> she's standing there looking at him. He's like, oh, I shall be yours. <laughs> he's like, you shall be mine. I shall be yours. You shall be mine. I shall be yours. You belong to me. I belong to you. That's what went on. <laughs> Sorry, I'm slow. <laughs> Just get behind me on the interstate, and you will, because I drive slow. <laughs> Not really, but you. If I do any fast driving, I'll turn it over to Josiah. <laughs> I was slow that day. But finally, he broke through. <laughs> I got it right. <laughs> So, let's go on. So, they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. They no longer belong to themselves. They don't belong to the first Adam. They don't belong to Satan. They belong to the Lord. How many can say with me, we have a new creation? What do I mean by that? We have a new Adam. We have a new man. And that man is the Lord Jesus Christ in his body. And he is ours and we are his. And the banner over us is love. Right? Is that not right? So they overcome him by the word of their testimony, which is said there uh, concerning the church of Philadelphia, the word of the testimony of Jesus. They're presenting Christ to the adversary, the devil, bringing Christ into view, not just in proclamation, but in life, right? There's the word of the testimony is life and light. The light is the proclamation. The life is the sure foundation. Right? They did not love their lives unto death. They were willing to relinquish their life, not just by physical death, but yes, by physical death as well. They were willing to lose their life in order to have the life of Christ first. Thus they could lose their physical life and be in the will of God. So I want to then turn this to a second to chapter 12 to state the obvious. Leave it to me. Stephen, to just state the obvious, maybe overstate it. So looking at this, what we would call this final time period, the woman is being readied. And I hope we can see this in its eternal perspective. She has been made ready for what, Terry? For direct conflict with the dragon. She's been made ready. Christ in her, Christ through her, direct conflict with the dragon. We can read about it in chapter 12. God has wanted this vessel for a couple of thousand years. What do you think, Drew? Could finish Genesis 3.15, crush the head of the dragon crush its government. A government of the dragon has nothing in the woman. She has the government of the Lord himself. She has been prepared again for direct conflict, final conflict with the dragon. That's unprecedented and has never occurred before.
because she is prepared for this final hour, the final hour comes. The direct conflict with the dragon occurs. The dragon has nothing. The dragon cannot overcome her like he did Eve. His government is crushed, ineffective over her. She is completely, utterly, totally under the government of Christ, inwardly, outwardly. Does not matter how you look at her. And it's these final years, those final years, I want to say this. So she's been made ready to a measure for there to be the birthing of the man-child, but those final years are about the confrontation with the dragon. Can you hear that? Those final years for her is the greatest of conflicts, that of confronting the dragon. The Lord better be in her. And he is. She's been made ready for that confrontation. God talked about in Genesis 3.15. She's prepared for this final hour, this battle that looms in front of her and comes to her and her to that battle. Now we're going to see the real house of God, Brian. Now we will see the dwelling place of God in the spirit. Now we will see one who does not fail in the temptation, does not, is not deluded, is not deceived, Jacob, by the dragon, by the serpent, by the devil, by Satan, but instead overcomes him in direct. I can't emphasize that enough. I'm not talking about whether, you know, it's kind of Jesus and Satan, you know, up there, but she's just battling some demons. She is not. She is battling the dragon himself who's been cast down to the earth and is directly confronting her, and she is directly confronting him. It is the clash of clashes going on. Pure darkness versus pure light of life. It is beautiful, Drew. And she can't defeat this woman. He can't defeat this woman. He can't defeat this Eve. He can't defeat this mother of the nations. She overcomes him who's been trying to overcome her for how long? And has overcome many of her, those predecessors but not her. Now God has the vessel, and now God has the man-child, and now, it says, has come the power. Now's come the kingdom. You can read it there in chapter 12. Now has come the salvation, the power, the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. Now there is the Lord in a vessel, that Satan can't destroy, Satan can't take charge of, Satan can't lead astray. Now, I say bring it on. Let's be that unto the Lord. How about you? It's not about knowing it's there. It's the Lord's invitation is directly to all of us here, all of us who are listening and who will listen. The invitation of the Lord is to all of us. Be that unto him. Let him be that in us and let's be that unto him. Let the dragon be cast down to earth in a direct confrontation because she's come to that place and the accuser has nothing. Satan has nothing. The accuser, the devil, the adversary has nothing in her and he comes down with great wrath and she faces, John, the wrath. She faces the rage of the dragon himself and he can't defeat her. He can't overcome because the Lord is in her that much. Is that not beautiful? That's her hour. And she was purposed for that hour. In her final temptation, her final seven-year time frame, her final, the end of all of it is her facing down the dragon and the Lord in your face, dragon. Here's a vessel you can't defeat. <laughs> How do you like that? 
That's her hour. I'm ready for it, aren't you? <laughs> what do you think, Shelly? <laughs> I'm with you. It's time, isn't it? Past time, actually. But it's our time. Let's not botch it. So, because she's in Christ in that kind of relationship, and because he's in her in that kind of relationship, she is ready. I just wanted to add that to our concept of readiness. Inwardly possessed of the Lord, outwardly under the control of his spirit, life and light shining, unhindered, Christ through her, Christ in her, and Satan has nothing in her. Just like Jesus said, Satan is coming again, but he has nothing in me. Well, he has nothing in her. So like there in chapter 3, I'll make the, uh, that assembly that calls itself of God that's of Satan bow down to you. So the woman is in direct confrontation and God causes the earth to help her. So God helps her. God helps her by the spirit of God within. And the earth helps her by the spirit of God without. Both. Not one or the other. Both. This is the final page. <laughs> I mean, of my notes, not in what God has to say. I don't even know if I got to his page yet. I'm probably, I'm probably some, somewhere in the introduction <laughs> of what God wants to say. Seriously, that's okay. So the woman's there to confront the false prophets. The woman's there to confront the false teachers. The woman's there to confront the false assembly, the false church. The woman in her final bridal readiness is in a confrontation mode against ultimate darkness, ultimate evil, the dragon, Satan, the accuser, the devil, the adversary, the serpent. And that's her hour. And that's her purpose, at least a part of it. But the man child, chapter 11, the man child's there in confrontation with outer court Christianity. I know that from the measuring in chapter 11, leaving out the outer court. The right relationship with God is countering what is filled not with the nation of Christ, what Peter says, we are a royal priesthood, we are a holy nation. The outer court of what's called Christianity or the church has become filled with a different nation's plural, John. Nation's plural. Not the nation that Peter is referencing. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. But there's an outer court type dynamic going on outward it's called the church, and the Lord's not in it. And so it's not measured in chapter 11. And the witnesses don't come from that kind of relationship. They come from a holy of holies or a holy place. There's no veil anymore. So it's all a holy place, the most holy place. And the witness has come from that relationship, right? So they're in a confrontation directly with outer court Christianity. They're in a confrontation because of, when you read it, you can read it about the, the oil. I guess we need to read it, but I just want to say scripturally what I'm talking about when I say this. <clears throat> These are, verse 4 of chapter 11, these are the two olive trees, two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Here's what that's saying. They're in a direct confrontation with the false anointing because the anointed one Christ who's been given all authority in heaven and in earth is in them. 
and everything false, a false anointing, false oil, is being countered and confronted by the two witnesses. They're in direct supply to the resource Christ within them. Heralding back to Zechariah's prophecy. So it's a confrontation. The man-child's in a confrontation with a false anointing. That's going to include false signs and wonders, false miracles over and against real miracles that are of Christ, of God. True signs and wonders that are of Christ and are of God. The man-child's in direct confrontation with it. They're getting direct confrontation against the false testimony. The testimony of Jesus versus the testimony of what just I was rightly talking about this morning. A, and he talks about in Corinthians, an other than Jesus, an other than spirit. What, that's what Paul writes to the Corinthians, right? Someone comes preaching a Jesus we didn't preach or representing a spirit that it's not the Holy Spirit. You receive him. The man child's in direct confrontation against that by showing the real. That's the confrontation. The man child's in a confrontation with the beast. The woman's in confrontation with the dragon. The man child's in confrontation with the beast. So the dragon can't get what he wants himself, so he raises up people to do his bidding to get at this vessel. And so the the man child's in direct confrontation with the beast. Again, Revelation chapter 11, after they have finished their testimony, though, they are protected. They cannot be touched until after they have finished the testimony of Jesus. Then the beast rises up and kills them. But they have been in direct confrontation with the beast. They wanted, the beast wanted them dead long before the end of the three and a half years. The listeners there in Jerusalem who were hearing the message of the testimony of Jesus, says in chapter 11, were being tormented by the message of Jesus. Tormented. They wanted to murder them. Murder them. That's the beast. And you can read about it. The beast wants to murder them and does as soon as their testimony is over. But they can't murder them until the testimony is finished. God is protecting the witnesses until they finish their testimony. The Lord Jesus was protected for three and a half years, just like here. Same length of time of ministry. For three and a half years, he was protected. He could not be killed till it was his time. And Jesus didn't stay dead long, did he? Three days. Theirs is three and a half, and they're back on their feet. What you going to do then? Well, most of the time, if you're, you know, if you're Lazarus, they're going to try to murder you again. That's what it says. They wanted to murder Lazarus again. Did you know that? Lazarus had already died once. He'd been dead once. They wanted to murder him again, Jesus and him. That's the kind of stuff we're dealing with there. I don't understand that callousness, but it's there. So uh, it's this confrontation with the beast, but it's the confrontation is proven to be on resurrection ground, a confrontation that the beast can't win. Because the life that Christ is, the resurrection, is greater than death. And he's only going to, it only gives him opportunity, Debbie, to pr prove that all over again. Go ahead and kill them. See how long they stay dead. Three and a half days, they're back on their feet. And then God sends an earthquake and kills 7,000 people. So, I'm asking the Lord in this, when you're looking at these two vessels, the woman and the man-child, I'm asking the Lord, guys, in our hearts, I, I think I already know the answer to this, but I'm saying it so we can all say it individually if we've not said it before, back to the Lord. God's ending could never come without these vessels. 
could not come without readiness. Without readiness, the man-child won't come forth. But with readiness, not the final readiness. I'm talking about the final readiness for the bride being the confrontation with the dragon. Did you hear what I said? The final readying of the bride is the confrontation with the dragon. It is her destiny. The destiny of God in her. God's purpose could never be brought forth without that woman. We've been invited by the Lord to be that, to become that unto him. I give myself to the Lord not half-heartedly, not a little bit, but wholeheartedly. I don't want to be my own. I choose not to be. I choose to be his completely. To not waste my time, my energies, my focus on myself. To not be dominated by the cares of this life. Hear what I'm saying? Not be dominated by the cares of this life. I'm not promoting uh, being irresponsible. I'm not promoting that. But not to be dominated by the cares of this life. To not allow my soul to win and overcome me, nor the devil, but to allow the Lord to overcome me, to allow him to win. That's your heart. I want you to just stand on your feet where you're at. Stand on your feet. And as you stand upon your feet, all those who have problems with their feet, I said this last night, I'm going to say it again now. Two things I'm going to pray for again tonight. The Lord's the healer. I'm not asking for a gift of healing to be in operation, though I believe in that. But that's not what the will of the Lord is in this moment. In this moment. The will of the Lord is himself to be the healer. So I'm asking the Lord again to heal our ears and now as well to heal our feet. That's an outward thing, but what is going on here is an inward thing. We desire to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church and we desire inwardly to stand and for him to make us able to stand and withstand and stand and withstand under all circumstances, whatever they may be, whenever they may occur, in this time and in the future. The Lord has exactly what he wants, which has become what I want. How about you? That he gets what he has eternally wanted. So Lord, I'm asking then you as the healer to heal the ears you go all the way down to the feet, legs and feet, but I'm going to focus upon the feet. I'm saying this now. Areas where the heel is an issue, you have problems with your heels. You're not a heel, but you have problems with your heel. I'm asking the Lord to heal right now, to be the healer and heal, heals. Now, if you are a heel in the natural, maybe he'll heal that too. Oh, I just had to joke about that. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> no, Lord, heal our feet. Okay, anybody, let me see your hands. If you have problems with your heels, let's see, your heel. Okay, not your, you're not a heel, but you have problems with your heel. Okay, so there, there's some hands going up. Not, don't raise your hands, raise your feet. It's your feet that's the problem, not your hands. No, I'm totally kidding. There I go again. Humor. <laughs> let's get those feet up there high, will you? <laughs> let's do a handstands. <laughs> <laughs> Say, man, the Lord couldn't be in here. He absolutely is. He's standing right there. <laughs> Good. So, Lord, be 
her healer. What's your first name again, sister? What's your first name? Dot. 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 May the Lord be your healer right now. And that's not because of my words. It'll be the Lord being the healer. <laughs> Amen. Good. And I didn't get to get your name, sister, earlier. Sean. Sean, the Lord heal your heels. Is it both or just one? We right heal. Randall, did you have your hands up needing healing in the heels? Which is it one or, or both? Or both? Lord, heal Randall now. Back over here to Teresa needed healing, right? Denise needs healing. Anybody else? Healing in the hills. Good. I'm not, not good that you need healing, but good that there's a healer. <laughs> I don't mean it that way. But healing in the feet now as well, yes. Rachel, need healing? Okay. Need healing, brother? So the Lord is here. Here's how the Lord wants this to work. He's here. He's all we need. He's moving us a bit away from gifts to himself again is what my point is. That's what his point is. That's what I'm just saying it. Not vessels, himself. Not me, not you, him. So the Lord wants to prove this against what's going to happen in the days ahead, continue to happen. It's going to grow and it's happening as the Lord himself is to his people all they need again. So can you see where he's headed with that? That's going to be a woman. It's going to be a bride. It's going to be a man child. And they're going to trust him and not themselves anymore. They're not going to trust anyone but him in a good way. I mean that. They'll trust him and they'll trust those who really are his body. So as the healer now, Lord, heal the feet. Heal the ears. And the other thing that was anointed is the big toe on the right foot that was anointed. Right? But also the thumb on the right hand was anointed. So they anointed the right ear, they anointed the right thumb, and they anointed the right big toe. So now, hands. You need healing in your hands. Why don't you just put your hands up? I said, no, no wait a minute ago. Now let's put our hands up. If you need healing in your hands now, Lord, heal, I ask, in the name of Jesus. I'm asking the Lord simply to be who he is. Aren't you? And I'm, I'm doing more than that though, Drew, aren't you? I'm expecting him to be who he is. Who's always been? It's nothing new. If we can't trust the medical, we can trust Christ. I'm not saying we can't trust any of the medical, but if we, we trust the Lord more than we trust anyone, even bare aspirin. We trust the Lord more than St. Joseph aspirin. I don't care how saintly it is. That's a joke. <laughs> we trust the Lord. We put our trust in you, Lord, for our, our hearing restored and to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, for our feet to be restored, Lord, that we might and you in us stand and not grow weary and not become faint. And that, Lord, you restore the strength of God into our hands. Isn't that right, Scott? Just hold your hands out there, Scott, like that. The strength of God to your hands, Scott. The strength of God. And then coming, the finger of God's on your back, right there in the center of your back, coming down. So the finger of God, the fiery finger of God, actually. So there's got to, going to be some heat involved in this. So the Lord's fiery finger coming down your spinal column, and coming down low into your back and bringing healing in that lower back. Does that sound good? That's the, the angel of the Lord actually standing behind you there. So yes, Lord, do that now. The angel of the Lord means the Lord's gone from here to there to perform a specific task. So that dealt with not just the hands, but with the back. So strength. Strength that overcomes arthritis. God's renewing strength coming up through the hands, through the wrists, all the way up into the shoulder area. God's healing the hands, healing the wrists, the forearms, coming up into the shoulder areas. Yeah. 
Yes, Lord, be who you are, for you certainly are who you are, the healer. So uh, I think there's one final thing. Well, I'm asking the Lord to be the healer. Whether I can say it or not doesn't matter. The Lord's the healer. You know, I remember there in the New Testament in the book of Acts, don't you? When they had such expectation of the Lord. They had expectation of the Lord. That Peter just, the shadow, he walked by. It wasn't about Peter, it was about the Lord. Peter just walked by, but they recognized the Lord as the healer. They recognized and wanted and expected. And I'm not, I'm not talking about great vessels anymore. I'm talking about a great Jesus, right? Yes. So there's a final thing here. The, the Lord said it to me this way. I want you to remember me, he said. There's hearkening back to the, what we would call communion, but actually he's dealing with the marriage ceremony. Remember me. So the Lord said it that way, and then he said, memory. There's healing for memories and healing from memories. Some memories have scarred our memory. And the actual problem with our memory is memories. So we break memories that are now, I've never done this before, and I'm not doing it now. The Lord is. Memories that obstruct and hinder memory. Break it now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Restore memory. Break the power of those memories that had power over our memory and over our hearts. Thank you, Lord. You know, I would be through, but I'm convinced the Lord isn't. So, John, transition is in front of you. The Lord's in it. It may not be tomorrow. I don't think it is. But it's not years either. Transition is in front of you. The Lord is going to lead you and order your steps. He will not only lead and order your steps, he's going to go before you. Now, these are not random promises. I could say this, but that's not what's going on. So deep within your inward man, there has been a God question put within you. And it has been, Lord, is there another step? And the Lord would answer that if that's true. There is another step, a transitional step. I hope that's not frightening. I don't think it is. I think it's actually to your inward man meant to be confirming to your inward man. There is another step. Okay, so there are spiritual steps. Sometimes to take a spiritual step is to take a geographical step. Both are needed. Now, that's quite directive, but I actually believe it to be more confrontational or confirmational, not confrontational. I hope it's not confrontational, <laughs> especially between you and your wife, <laughs> but confirmational. Are they watching tonight? I hope so, because they can blame it on me, not you. But there's no blame in it. It is unto spiritual purpose, spiritual intent. It will involve a new job, and the Lord will make a way for you. I know this is very directive, but uh, I have to say it this way to you. Now, the Lord could come right to you and say it, but he didn't choose to do it that way. He chose to use the jackass me to say it, but I am your friend, and you know how much I love you. And normally I wouldn't do this because I know you, but I know nothing about what I'm saying and anything other than what the Lord said to me. So I'm going to say it right to you. It is like the Lord inserting a key to your inward man to unlock. You have been shut down. 
you have been shut down. And the Lord aims to unlock you. And when he does, it will mean movement. It will mean locational movement. And it will be a spiritual movement that is going to go on. Now, I'm not dealing with just some prophetic word. The Lord's power is coming in this. For he will lead you and direct your steps and lead you in his timing. Timing becomes extremely important now. To the next step, the next place, the next job, the next beginning. There will be a surrounding of those that have equal purpose, equal heart, equal desire, equal intent. You, Sarah, will thrive, blossom, and bloom in the Lord. I don't know, normally want to give long words because you can start in the spirit and get off into the soul and that's not my intent. Just because I can see a thing doesn't mean I need to say it. But I think I'll stop there because I think that's the limit for now of what the Lord wants to say to you, my dear brother. Just wait on the Lord just a second. This applies to a number of people in the room. I think this is going to be the final thing I'm to say. I saw a book being closed. It was a final chapter that had played out. The Lord took the book after the final chapter had played itself out, put the book on a shelf, and brought down a new book. And the new book had nothing written in it. It was a new beginning and a fresh start. And for a number of you, uh, you have come to a final chapter, a final season. I'm not talking about death. I am talking about transition. You've come to a final chapter. Of a former time, that chapter has come to an end. Not in a wrong way, in a necessary way. Now God takes the book down, another book with a new chapter, a new chapter of your life, lives dealing with not just individuals here, dealing with families. New chapter to your life. And so the opening of the book, that book, the second book, was timed. And this is a little bit specific in one sense, not really, but... Uh, when I saw the book open, the page that it began with was 2023, not 2022, 2023. And the first chapter began there. I'm, I'm convinced that's a little bit uh, put into that language so that it will not be overly specific so that we'll have to trust the Lord. You know who you are anyway as to the realization that the chapter in a book of a book and of a time is closing and a new one is beginning. Josiah and I have been saying this for quite some time and that by the Lord's doing. God is moving his people into his will. And on occasions, it's entailing physical move. 
So I'm asking right now, Lord, no confusion, and certainly not people trying to make something happen, but I'm asking for this to be the confirmation that is needed. That the book and the final chapter of that book is coming to a quick end and being closed. I hope you will rejoice because there's a new book and a new chapter, a new era and a new time. So I ask the Lord to give courage, to give resources, to be wisdom, and to be specific timing. May the three hands of the clock line up, the second's hand, the minute's hand, and the hour's hand, line up, point a single direction, single direction, and when they do, that's called perfect timing, and it's worth waiting for. God's will is in that single direction. So we ask that now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. One final prayer, though, for this cornerstone church here. I ask for the Lord to now raise his banner and together the people of the Lord, other people of the Lord in the area, in the region that are meant to be a part, Lord, to be a part of this community that you have been and are raising up in, Lord. You are raising up yourself in. I ask, Lord, for those who have not known to now know, to hear, to recognize, to understand your intent, your purpose, for their being joined here according to the will of God, not the will of man. They come, Lord, hungry for Jesus. May they come, Lord, hungry for you, and the fellowship of Christ, and the truth as it is in Jesus, and as the life that you are, as the light that you are, as the way that you are. May they come, Lord having just been dissatisfied with everything that's not the Lord coming for the Lord. They are there, Lord, in this region, not knowing yet, not hearing yet. Awaken, Lord. Lead them, Lord. Guide them, I ask, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, Terry. That was awesome, awesome, awesome. So we'll see you. Uh, have a great night. 10 o'clock in the morning, we'll see you tomorrow, and I think it's going to be great. So you want to make sure you're here. Have an awesome night. Be blessed. Amen.